Okay, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Cañada Blanche lecture series with uh, the Governor of the Bank of Spain, Pablo Hernández de Cos. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm Andrés Rodríguez Pose. I am the Princesa de Asturias Chair here at the LSE and the Director of the Cañada Blanche Center, which is also the center for all of you if you want to join uh, at any time. Um, I'm going to introduce Pablo Hernández de Cos, uh, uh, and then we have this great privilege because it's not easy to get central bankers to come and talk anywhere. It's not easy to get central bankers to come and talk at universities, and it's not easy to get central bankers to actually come and talk without any format. So he's going to be presenting, and then there are going to be questions coming from the audience, and that is rare. But I must say that with Pablo, Everything has been very, very easy. So I hope that you'll be preparing your questions, uh, sharpening your knives in a nice way, <laughs> as uh, this is the tradition here at the LSE, and we'll have a very interesting uh, conversation. But let me just introduce Pablo Hernández de Cos first. Uh, Pablo Hernández de Cos is the governor of the Bank of Spain, and he's a member of the governing and general council of the European Central Bank. He's chair of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and of the Advisory Technical Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. He's a member of various European and international committees, including the ESRB, the Financial Stability Board, the Bank for International Settlements, Group of Governors and Heads of Supervision, the Advisory Board of the Financial Stability Institute, and the Center for Monetary Studies in Latin America. He's also vice chairman of the board of the Spanish Macroprudential Authority Financial Stability Board. Prior to his current position as uh, governor of the Bank of Spain, he was director general for economics, statistics, and research, of the Bank of Spain. He headed the economic policy analysis division, and he worked as uh, an advisor to the ECB's European Central Bank's executive board and as an economist at the Bank of Spain. He holds a PhD in economics from my alma mater, the Complutense University of Madrid, a degree in economics and business uh, studies from CUNEF, and a degree in law from the Spanish Open University. But I think the, the words that would probably describe us what Pablo is, is uh, when uh, he became governor, uh, I asked a friend of mine who happens to work at the Bank of Spain as a civil servant, under him, how was the new governor? And I think her answer was very, very clear. I'm proud to work with someone who is always the best prepared in the room and who has the best command of all the dossiers that are discussed in that meeting. So um, that's that's a friend. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't know whether she was a friend or not, uh, or friend or foe, but she replied, and I think she said it from her heart. So that probably describes what, who you are. So Pablo, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Andres, for, for the nice uh, words. Uh, uh, and of course, to, to Cañada Blanc uh, and, um, and LSE. Well, you, you know, uh, or you should know, students, I mean, um, that LSE for, for us, uh, for economists, is, uh, is a, a kind of a legend. So you are studying in a, in a legendary uh, school, in a legendary university. So um, don't miss uh, the opportunity. Um, being uh, with, uh, with Andres here at LSE, I thought uh, that in order perhaps to, to have a proper and interesting discussion after uh, my, my words, my initial uh, introduction, um, one topic that could be uh, of um, a lot of interest uh, for you as students is uh, to focus on the future of globalization. Um, and I guess it's obvious to, to everybody that the, the questions uh, currently surrounding uh, this topic are of the utmost importance, and in particular, I think it's uh, of utmost importance for economies, and this is the case uh, for the European Union, but also for, uh, for the UK, that are highly open and integrated uh, economies. And the motivation, uh, I guess, is uh, clear to, to everybody, but let me spend, uh, before entering into, into the substance, uh, maybe spend a few minutes also uh, trying to, to put the focus on why, you know, focusing on this uh, topic. 
So um, we have experienced in the last uh, three years two extraordinary shocks. First was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and later uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which uh, we all know they disrupted uh, in a very significant manner global value chains and commodity markets. And they have generated, because I think we are still in this environment, and, uh, an environment of hate and uncertainty and geopolitical tensions. And if you add this, this is the novelty of the, of the last uh, two, three years, but you should also take into account the, the past and present uh, uh, episodes of trade uh, tensions between the, the US and, and China, um, among others. So um, that uh, it's obvious, and if you uh, uh, read uh, newspapers, it's obvious to everybody, that these talks have prompted renewed questions regarding the future of globalization and the increasing importance of geopolitical factors in shaping international uh, economic relations. And I think this is a novelty you know, for many of us who have been in this business of um, studying economics and then uh, being a practitioner as an economist, um, the fact that one of the main risks, if you read any financial stability report of any institution, including, of course, uh, the Bank of Spain, you will see that the main risk, the first risk in the list, is geopolitical uh, factors. Um, although the globalization of goods uh, was uh, slowing down even before the pandemic, uh, concerns about the resilience of global value chains and the supply security of strategic products are now becoming more apparent uh, and are becoming more, uh, more apparent in particular in, particular in decisions uh, made by, by firms, by, but also by, by governments. And in particular, if I focus just uh, for one second in governments, it's obvious that governments have become more concerned that trade and financial openness may create dependencies on third countries that increase uh, the vulnerability, uh, their own vulnerabilities to these geopolitical uh, shocks. And accordingly, they are trying to, to respond to this new environment and they have started to include geopolitical considerations in their economic uh, decision making with uh, political uh, initiatives that the main aim is precisely to limit such external uh, vulnerabilities. And again, one element that I want uh, to stress as this is important for for any country, but it's particularly relevant for countries that are such open as it is uh, the European Union. And uh, again, um, let me say that the European Union is probably the jurisdiction uh, that is uh, confronted with uh, the highest openness in, in the global world. And let me put just uh, one uh, number. 2019, for example, the share of foreign trade in, in the euro area reached 54% of GDP. It was uh, 31% in 1999. So there has been a significant increase in the, in the share of foreign trade. Well, this is double the number in the US. In the US, this number is 26%. Let me give you another number. The share of global value chain participation in trade. This is uh, around 20% percentage points higher in the euro area than uh, in, the, in the US. And if you uh, look at uh, financial numbers, the euro area is again more financially open than the US, as measured, for example, by the stock of gross external assets and liabilities with respect to, to GDP. So meaning if uh, we are more open, uh, more dependent on, on, on international trade, of course, we have also to be more concerned about a potential risk of uh, deglobalization. Okay, that's the, 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 the main um, uh, proposition I wanted to to, to, to analyze uh, today. Um, so I will uh, structure my, my presentation in, in three topics. Okay, the first one will be precisely to give you a, an overview of why I think uh, Europe is particularly vulnerable. Okay, and I will be given some numbers on different um, elements of the European economy that uh, shows uh, these uh, vulnerabilities. Um, then I will focus on the, the policy response. Okay, and I will comment a bit on the, um, the autonomy strategy that has been followed by, by Europe. And I will add an element that for me, I don't know whether it's missing, but I, I think I'm still expecting to, to, to go in, into, into uh, more deeper and concrete uh, policies. And then I will uh, put the focus on one specific issue of economic policies, which is monetary policy, okay? Uh, because, um, 
central bankers, we've been spending the, the last 10 years also analyzing to what extent this, the, the, the globalization process um, affected inflation or monetary policy transmission or even the neutral interest rate, the concept of the neutral interest rate. So I guess it's obvious that we have also to try now to answer whether if in the end we get into the globalization process, whether there will be symmetric effects to those that we found when we were analyzing the globalization process. Okay, and I will also make some comments on, on, on that. So let, let, let me start with the first, uh, the first uh, topic. What are the main vulnerabilities observed as a consequence of the high degree of integration that Europe uh, has? And I will mention four, at least four vulnerabilities. The first one, um, is uh, Europe's uh, high external dependency with respect to some products which are key to the European Union economy, but which are imported from uh, a handful of non-EU uh, countries. So we are depending on these uh, uh, products, and it's not only that we are depending on these products, is that the exporters to Europe is, uh, are uh, a few, so only a few uh, number of, of countries. Let me uh, give you some very concrete examples. Uh, for example, China accounts for a large share of goods imports into the European Union. And in particular, China is the main exporter to the European Union of several electronic products, such as, for example, computers or optical uh, devices. And the domestic capacity, the domestic uh, production of Europe on these particular products is very, very low. Okay. By the way, this uh, situation is not unique. Uh, of the European Union, and this is why some uh, economists um, are um, applying uh, this, um, this sentence of a st or a statement that China is becoming something like a, the OPEC of uh, industrial uh, inputs, okay, which I think, I think is a very a good uh, description of what we want to, to tell um, um, this domain. So this depend dependence on China's uh, imports already, by the way, had uh, implications in particular, um, for example, in the first months of the pandemic. And there is a, already a, a paper published by the European Central Bank that is showing that uh, Chinese supply chains disruptions during the first months of the pandemic um, had a considerable impact on manufacturing output in, in the European, uh, in the Euro area in particular, temporarily reducing um, industrial production, manufacturing production in the Euro area by 7% which is a, a material number, it's a very significant number. Another example is uh, related to the European Union dependency on third countries for semiconductor production. Um, and here, what we know is that European companies are involved in the manufacture of uh, these pro products, yes, but they concentrate almost exclusively on the upstream um, stage of the production chain, okay? Um, uh, they provide manufacturing equipment and high purity materials used in, in cheap production, but European uh, companies account for an almost negligible uh, share of other critical stages of the production chain, such as cheap design, for example, or uh, assembly. Uh, and again, uh, here uh, there is also, uh, we are also heavily dependent on foreign suppliers, almost 80% of the suppliers of European semiconductor companies are based outside the European Union. Another very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, illustrative uh, number. Third example, trade in energy goods. Trade in energy goods is, uh, again, a prime example of concentration. One number, 2020, uh, year 2020, the European Union imported 60% of its energy. Uh, with four countries, for example, providing 70% of uh, uh, gas imports, uh, of which 40% came from Russia. Again, these three numbers, 60%, 70%, 40% are, again, very, very significant numbers. And, of course, the consequences of uh, this highly concentrated supply of uh, key raw materials uh, has been visible in the last uh, year, you know, after um, the, uh, the, 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 the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by, by Russia. So this is the current situation. What can we expect for the future? Um, well, it is true, uh, in, in particular, if we want to focus on energy, that the transition to a greener economy will, in principle, entail 
a sharp reduction in aggregate energy dependence. Uh, and it, this is all, it has already been estimated from around 60% today to around 10% in 2050 in a zero emissions uh, scenario. So if we are able no, to reach uh, to this zero uh, emissions scenario, the consequence uh, will be positive in terms, also in terms of uh, lower, much lower uh, uh, dependency um, on, on, on energy. But, and this is important, this uh, same policy, as by the way, also the digitalization of, of the economy, something that all governments in Europe are, are, are pursuing, will increase the European Union's need to import so-called critical raw materials. And let me explain why. These materials, for example, rare earths, that's uh, probably the, the best example, but also palladium, uh, um, cobalt, are also uh, other good examples. These are considered critical by, for example, in a, an analysis that was published by the European Commission, due to their economic importance, the difficulty in replacing them with other materials, and also by the high import concentration and other supply related risk. And again, for example, China uh, controls about half of global trade uh, of uh, rare earths um, and 80% of the refining capacity, okay, which again, they are very, very significant numbers. And another uh, number, uh, Russia is the European Union's main supplier of these raw materials accounting for 18% of the total value of such imports in 2019. Um, if you take into account this dependency today with the fact that again, uh, if you look at this uh, uh, document that was produced by the European Commission, the demand for these uh, uh, critical raw materials would increase more than five-fold uh, by 2030, because precisely if we want uh, to, to, to achieve this zero emissions scenario, the one that I was mentioning before. So the message is, okay, we are currently very much dependent on these uh, products, and it's true that if we are able to achieve the targets on, 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 on zero emissions, this dependency will decline, but at the cost also of, at least if there is not a material change, also a high dependence on some of the products that are necessary for, for this to, to, to happen. So it's a, it's a more forward-looking perspective, let's say. Well, this is about imports, but don't forget also, this is second point, a second vulnerability, which is related to export concentration. Um, and this is a key aspect for the European economy, because as uh, you perfectly know, uh, Europe has historically maintained a strong trade surplus. And by the way, trade surplus uh, and exports more in general have compensated to a significant extent the recent large terms of trade loss that uh, has been uh, due uh, to, the, to the high energy prices also related to the war in, in Ukraine. And uh, again, let me one, give you one example in this uh, regard. Uh, European Union exports of various pharmaceutical and chemical uh, products and some high uh, tech manufacturing goods are highly concentrated in this case uh, in the US and the UK. Okay? And are also characterized, by the way, by also relatively low domestic uh, demand. So it's not obvious that if there is a, a problem with um, these uh, uh, exports, this will be compensated, uh, not in principle, with just an increase in, in domestic demand. This is uh, something that uh, at least uh, um, I wouldn't take this as a, as a baseline no, for, a, for a scenario. Third uh, vulnerability, the geopolitical risk could also uh, have a bearing on the European Union's foreign uh, direct investment and portfolio exposures. And here, well, it's true that you have to look at the numbers uh, very carefully um, because it's not obvious uh, how to get you know, the, the degree of concentration of foreign direct investment and portfolio exposures. But again, the European Union's main investment partners uh, are uh, other advanced uh, economies. But when you look at the data uh, more in detail, you also see that in particular, um, um, the, when you take into account the origins of foreign direct investment into the European Union on an ultimate uh, investor basis, we find that exposures with respect to the US, but also to China, are also very, very significant. And if I focus not on direct investment, but on portfolio of flows, what we see is that, um, in particular, the research that has been concentrating on restating holdings from a residence-based approach to a nationality-based approach, so that, for example, in, in the year 2017, the URL holdings of Russian and Chinese debt triple uh, when uh, issuance via tax havens was accounted. Okay, so once that you take into account all the different elements that, uh, I mean, are difficult 
to, to graphs in, in, the, in the data, you find that there is also a significant concentration uh, in these foreign direct investment and portfolio exposures. And then finally, a fourth vulnerability that I, I, I want to mention is related to um, geopolitical risk um, coming from the over-reliance uh, of EU participants on non-EU players in, in this case, financial market infrastructures and also on uh, digital financial services. And here, again, uh, there are um, several uh, examples that are relevant. Let me mention a few. Uh, this includes uh, the dominant position of non-EU payment-related services providers in intermediating European payment transactions. This is a, a very clear example. The over-reliance of European Union market participants on third country uh, clearing services, and also the rapid uh, rise of non-EU big techs uh, and the complexity of this uh, crypto ecosystem, which is dominated by few large crypto asset service providers, uh, often, uh, very often located outside the European uh, Union. So in short, uh, let me try to summarize this uh, first part of the, of the talk. Um, the European Union, of course, like many other economies around the world, including the, the European, uh, the, the UK, faces a number of uh, external trade and financial vulnerabilities related to our high integration into uh, global value chains and high dependence on certain imports, exports, and non-domestic financial market uh, infrastructure. Okay, that would be the, the main conclusion for this, for this part. So let's now move to the, to the second part. And um, uh, before entering into the, the policy reaction uh, of, of the European Union, let me try to, to give a, a brief overview of what is the interpretation that we are given to the most recent uh, data, okay? And uh, it's, it's not obvious, uh, the, um, because it's, it's, it's probably too early to, to know how and to what extent um, these new policies will affect globalization trends. But if I can summarize what, um, um, what the data seems to be uh, showing uh, uh, nowadays, um, they seem to be shifting from dependence to diversification. Okay, now I will, I will say a few words about this now. Second trend from efficiency to security. And the third trend um, that might be observed is from globalization to regio regionalization. Okay, and let me uh, give also you uh, to you some some examples of, of these uh, trends. So first, uh, what we are observing is that companies are reducing their dependence on certain suppliers. So this uh, idea of seeking greater diversification. Okay, um, which of course. I mean, they are doing the, uh, this, uh, this because uh, they, they, they think that this is very useful in reducing the impact of global supply shocks, for sure. So uh, there are already some surveys. You cannot see this in the data, but uh, there are already some surveys that, for example, show that by the end of 2021, almost half of the companies had diversified their supplier base compared with only 5% that had implemented measures to return production to the company's home country. So, it's not so much that uh, companies are moving back, okay, their production capacities to their or the, the, the countries of origin, but what they are trying is to diversify, okay, which uh, I think in, in terms of uh, economic, uh, potential economic consequences, I think is, is better in, a se in the sense that this diversification may even imply or generate greater macroeconomic stability on, uh, and even uh, less volatility, at, 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 le at least if... Uh, uh, what we are in a context or in an environment on which geopolitical risks are, are becoming uh, very, very relevant and very, uh, very frequent. Let me give uh, you also uh, more, more, more numbers. Uh, the European Investment Bank, uh, they, they produce uh, annually uh, a survey, and the last uh, was focused also on these uh, particular topics. And what they found is that half of the US companies and one third of the European uh, Union ones have reacted already to the recent trend disruptions by focusing more on the domestic market. Um, and there is a, uh, another McKinsey survey uh, on supply uh, chain leaders uh, worldwide, which basically finds that last year, 81, 81% of firms adopted dual sourcing uh, strategies for raw materials. And the numbers in 2021 were 55%. So there is a, also a very significant increase in, the, in, the, in, in, in firms adopting this strategy. Second uh, trend uh, that I was uh, mentioning is this move or um, change in priority uh, from, uh, uh, from, from efficiency to, 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 to safety. Um, and here, uh, a case in point, I would say, is the French shoring. 
a concept as a, a strategic objective in the case of the US, but also, for example, in the case of the European Union, Europe now aims to double its share of global semiconductor production to 20% by 2030. This is a, a good example of, uh, well, this, in, in this trade-off between security uh, um, and efficiency, we are putting more weight to the security part of it and maybe losing uh, some uh, efficiency because it's clear in principle that uh, this increased uh, security is likely to lead to less uh, risk-sharing capacity being between countries and also probably also to higher con con uh, um, um, transaction uh, cost. And the third trend is uh, this one I was mentioning, uh, moving uh, from globalization to, to regionalization. Uh, and again, there is already some numbers here uh, as an illustration in 2022, 44% of global companies were developing regionalized supply networks. And the number for 2021 was 25%. So will, again, the increase in this, uh, in this trend has been also very significant in just uh, one year. So let me uh, just now focus on what uh, the European Union is doing. You know that the response the European Union uh, uh, to these uh, challenges uh, has been through the so-called open strategic uh, autonomy uh, agenda. And under this uh, framework, there are basically three main policies or types of uh, policies. The first is a set of uh, measures that is basically aiming to assess supply chain dependencies and vulnerabilities and an increase um, in the resilience of the European in, uh, industrial system. I was already mentioned some of them, for example, this action plan on critical uh, raw uh, materials, which uh, aims at reducing the EU uh, external dependence uh, in the sourcing uh, of uh, such goods. But I have to mention also the Repower uh, initiatives, uh, which uh, main uh, aim is reducing the EU energy dependence or also the plans uh, to drive the digitalization of European economies. This is a one line of action. The second is a set of measures aiming to protect e European Union countries from possible abusive practices adopted by their countries. Um, practices that may be related well, to, to a strategic or also to political objectives. And these measures include uh, those aimed at monitoring uh, foreign direct investment flows from third countries and other measures designed to limit coercive uh, actions against European uh, companies. And then a third uh, class of measures uh, is aiming to preserve the international level playing field by compensating for competitive disadvantages that European Union companies might face due to less stringent environmental and stated policies implemented by uh, third countries. And a very good example is, for example, the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, probably the, 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 the most uh, important and, and relevant uh, one among, uh, of the measures among uh, this uh, uh, third uh, type of uh, policies. So what would be my main take for, uh, from, from all this? Well, I think it's justified. I think the, the, the reasoning behind this, uh, this uh, um, uh, change in policy in, in Europe is, is justified, and I think the policies uh, might provide the, the results uh, that are uh, expected uh, of uh, the implementation. But uh, it's also true, and it's related to what I was mentioning at the very uh, beginning of the talk, what I see is also that if we want in parallel, not to, to increase uh, our autonomy, if we want to minimize the losses in terms of efficiency, um, because I mean, there will be cost uh, of uh, the globalization process that we have to accept. Uh, but even also to ensure uh, a more uh, robust and resilient uh, European Union economy, uh, in my view, a strategic uh, autonomy policies should be accompanied by a substantial deepening of EU integration. So I see deepening EU integration as a kind of, uh, of policy policies um, that could compensate at least to a certain extent okay, the, the cost of this deglobalization process. And here, we all know that there are many issues uh, to, be, to be done. There is uh, being a lot of improvement in particular in the last decade, but um, uh, uh, we all know that uh, there are many also issues that are pending. So for example, let me give just two, three um, uh, elements. Uh, that are pending, we need to equip the Economic and Monetary Union with a permanent macroeconomic stabilization capacity that we don't have. We have to finish the job on, on the banking union, and this uh, has to be completed with the construction of a, a European Union deposit guarantee system. And for sure, uh, we have to make progress in building a capital market union, which is absolutely essential 
to increase the resilience of the European Monetary Union to macro financial shocks, to better spread the cost of asymmetric or idiosyncratic shocks, and to reduce the risk of financial fragmentation and provide a more favorable environment to private uh, investment. Okay, let me um, now turn to the third part of the, of the talk before entering into, into the dialogue, uh, Andres, which is on the consequences of uh, all these trends to monetary uh, policy. No? And I think the, the question uh, uh, um, that could be raised is uh, very obvious, is are all these uh, recent global developments relevant for the conduct of uh, monetary policy? And precisely uh, to try to answer uh, this question, let me review the channels through which globalization uh, might have impacted monetary policy. Because as I was um, uh, underlining at the beginning of the talk, we've spent, for example, in the strategic review of the European uh, Central Bank, the one that was uh, um, done between 2020 and 2021, and it was published and agreed by the Governing Council of the ECB in July, in June, sorry, 2021, we devoted um, a whole uh, analysis to the impact of globalization and how this globalization might condition monetary policy. So let me just uh, summarize what the, the outcome of this analysis uh, was. And I will concentrate on three potential consequences of globalization. First one is on inflation, both in the dynamics of inflation, but also on, on the trends uh, of inflation. Uh, second, on the monetary policy transmission. Okay. And then finally, on uh, the interest rate, uh, the neutral interest rate, no? let's say the more structural concept of, of interest rate. So first, uh, the, the evidence that we have is that, of course, in a context of increasing globalization, a number of global factors could impact inflation dynamics above and beyond domestic factors. So in very simple words, if uh, we have economies that are now more open, uh, we might think that inflation and inflation dynamics will depend more on global factors as compared to domestic factors, okay? And there is evidence of, of this. Uh, so for example, uh, there is evidence that the impact of global slack uh, on domestic inflation is positively related to a country's level of trade and financial openness. And therefore, there has been also an increase in the degree of synchronicity in the evolution of headline inflation, okay? However, it's also true that these effects are found to have a small impact, uh, they are not of a very significant nature. And it's also true that when you focus not on headline inflation, but on core inflation, so you eliminate energy and, and food, then this synchronicity almost disappears, okay? And indeed, core inflation is less correlated across countries uh, than headline and cross-country correlations of inflation tend to be smaller at longer horizon. So it's also short-lived, let's put it the, this, uh, this way. On, on inflation trends, of course, globalization could also affect uh, uh, inflation trends. For example, increased trade integration can interact inflation both directly by the fact that or through higher shares of imports from low-wage countries, okay, that would be a, an obvious way to reduce inflation, and inflation trends, but also indirectly via higher competition, international competition. And again, the evidence, the available evidence shows that this impact has been positive, but again, small in magnitude. And for instance, um, I can even be more precise, Eurosystem staff calculated that imports of goods from low wage economies reduce Euro area CPI inflation through direct effects and increased competition, so the direct and, and the direct effects by 0.16 percentage points per year in the last two decades, although this was thought to be an, an upper bound. So it's, it's material, it's a, it's a number, but it's not a big, a, a big, a big number. Let me now move to uh, the potential consequences of globalization to the transmission of monetary policy. And again, um, globalization developments greater trade openness, wider involvement in global value chains, an accumulation of uh, foreign assets and liabilities, broader dependence on international funding sources, uh, or increased synchronization of asset prices could have implications for the transmission uh, of monetary policy. And get me, let me give you one example, which is also supported by the evidence, is that uh, 
it shows that financial globalization has strengthened the exchange rate channel of monetary policy. Okay. Um, and by the way, this has even more than offset the weakening of the interest rate channel through global financial cycle effects. Uh, more open economies experience larger valuation losses and wealth effects on their external balance sheets in response to an exchange rate appreciation. And this is mainly the result that is obtained with the, with the data. Although, again, it's uh, very uh, complicated to, to look at all the channels, it's also true that globalization may have reduced the exchange rate pass through to import prices. And again, this is mainly because of competition, international competition. And uh, indeed, there is also evidence that this is also been the, 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 the case. And then finally, uh, another uh, element that has been discussed in the, in the literature, and I think is also very important, is the potential impact of globalization on the natural rate of interest. And here, uh, again, this is also subject of a, of a lot of debate and, and, and a heated debate. On the one hand, uh, one of the key determinants of the natural rate is productivity. One should expect uh, that if there is an increase in productivity, there should be also uh, an increase in the natural interest rate. And one also should expect that globalization, higher competition should in principle lead to higher productivity. Okay, But at the same time, we also have evidence that financial globalization may have reduced the natural rate of interest by increasing global demand of uh, safe assets. So there is a scarcity of safe assets, uh, safe assets, mainly because all emerging economies have entered into the financial world, Okay, and then uh, they, they, this has generated uh, an scarcity of these safe assets, and this has deepened and, uh, the, the natural rate of interest. W which of these forces uh, will prevail of, is, of course, uh, difficult to, to, to say. So one important element that is behind uh, all, the da all these doubts that we have on whether, in the end, globalization has generated uh, downward effects on, on inflation, whether inf uh, um, globalization has uh, modified the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, whether globalization has uh, uh, changed um, the, the natural rate of interest is because uh, it's not obvious what the impact of globalization is on uh, in markets, on pricing behaviors, and on markups. Okay, and let me just spend one minute on this because I think it's important. So on the one hand, I was, uh, I, I think I've already repeated it several times, trade participation in global value chains should in principle increase competition, okay? But then there is also a, a, another part of the literature and the most recent literature that uh, is been arguing that the interplay not only of globalization, but globalization, digitalization, and also the increase in, in the importance of intangible assets uh, may give rise to high margin firms with considerable market power. And we've seen that this is happening in our, in our economies. Uh, and this, of course, if this second uh, element prevails, this, of course, will have uh, completely different uh, consequences for inflation dynamics, inflation trends, um, the transmission of monetary policy, Etc. Etc. Okay, so um, the question is: Should we expect uh, symmetric effects from a deglobalization process? And it's not obvious. I don't have the answer. That's uh, that's the reality. But I would argue that there are several reasons that prevent us from assuming that this process is going to be symmetric. Okay, and I will give. Uh, five uh, elements uh, to, to support this, this view. The first, I think it's obvious from uh, what I said, it appears that um, the trends that we are observing are not fully consistent uh, with a deglobalization process, okay? But it's rather a change in the nature of globalization. So leading, I was mentioning a regionalization of trade and supply chains, a diversification of sourcing, a certain, yes, a slowdown in global value chain uh, fragmentation, but it's not a pure um, reduction in openness of our economies. It's much more complicated than, than that. Um, and by the way, for example, the flattening of trading goods uh, is indeed and hints a, a trend or, or, or a slowdown in globalization. But at the same time, what we are observing is a continued growth of international trade in services, um, which uh, this is particularly the case for uh, technological products, and um, including, by the way, data trading and also the expansion of artificial intelligence. So, I mean, it's true that in some uh, sectors, uh, goods in particular, we are observing these, these trends with all these nuances that I was mentioning, but in other products, 
the trend in globalization remains. It's, it's, still, it's still there. So that's my, 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 my first point. The second it, is that the impact of these new trends um, as opposed to a purely globalization or the globalization trend are far from obvious. And let me give just one example. So this offshoring uh, concept. Well, it's true. Offshoring uh, is usually related to job displacement can justify even because of this. But there are several uh, recent studies that highlight that it is also related to the upgrading of jobs towards more competitive and innovative varieties and to changes in employment composition in favor of high skilled workers. So again, the, the idea is that it's more, much more complex than uh, just to uh, a quick uh, uh, look uh, to, the, to the trends um, uh, would, uh, would imply. Third factor, well, it's also uh, an element that it is important. It's about the timing. So the globalization process has been a process that ha has last for years and relatively in a slow motion, okay? We don't know whether if in the end we, we end in a globalization process, this, can, this could be very abrupt, for example, due to, to the start of a war in a place. Um, and of course, then the consequences, the impact could be also nonlinear. So not symmetric, uh, as, as I was, uh, uh, it was the, the, the question I was trying to, to answer. Um, four point, very important. Of course, the, the final consequences of uh, this trend will depend crucially on the policies that will accompany the process. So it's of course not the same, and you should not expect the same uh, consequences if this process is um, accompanied by protectionist measures, that it is accompanied by subsidies to domestic uh, industries, or if it is accompanied by this concept of French shoring, or if it is accompanied by investment, an increase in, 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 in public, for example, investment that also leads to uh, so, uh, some uh, private investment. The consequences of, and the combination of these policies would lead to very uh, different uh, uh, consequences. Um, and then uh, finally, and on this is probably on the only thing on which I'm, I'm more, um, I have more a strong view, what it is obvious is that this policy, what is creating is higher uncertainty in general, and in particular, higher policy uncertainty. And of course, we know that uncertainty in general, policy uncertainty is not good for investment. Okay, and, uh, of, uh, and I don't see in the, in the next uh, few years or the, uh, the case that this uncertainty will decline dramatically uh, because it seems that uh, it's here to stay. Uh, and of course, this is probably one of the, of the consequences of this uncertainty was probably one of the most uh, obvious. So what, I, uh, what is my take uh, of all this uh, literature that I've tried to summarize on the impact of globalization on inflation, monetary policy, transmission, monetary policy, et cetera, and the potential consequences of the globalization uh, process. Um, well, it's true that these developments may affect the structural forces that shape the transmission channels of monetary policy and inflation, but given the elevated uncertainty regarding both the nature of these trends and also the implications um, uh, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these trends, my uh, um, policy conclusion is that monetary policy should not overreact to the potential supply side effects of a change in the nature of globalization in the short run. But on the contrary, we should keep track of its long run effects uh, uh, on the structure of the economy. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, I think that policymakers should act cautiously. And in the case of monetary policy, the monetary policy of the ECB, one of the key elements of the monetary policy of the ECB is precisely the fact that our price stability mandate, we define this price stability mandate uh, as medium, as with a medium term objective. So we are not trying to uh, stabilize inflation at 2% tomorrow, among other things, because monetary policy cannot do that. Okay, what we are trying is to stabilize inflation in the medium run. Okay, so taking this uh, also this attitude towards the potential consequences of globalization into uh, into inflation into monetary policy transmission, I think is also the adequate uh, one. And with this, I will I will finish on this. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Pablo, for a very, very enlightening presentation. You've raised uh, a lot of issues. You have not shied of making proposals. And now the way we're going to proceed is where I'm going to collect questions from the audience and uh, Pablo is going to answer, but I, I'll take the first question. But while you're thinking your questions, um, please think that these have to be questions. So I will challenge all of you to start your question by how, what, why, <laughs> to what extent, and finish with a question mark. We're not here to make statements, we're here to have a dialogue. And uh, so I will ask you to stand up, state your name, uh, if you are doing a degree at the LSE, which degree you're doing, where you're from, and then ask your question. But before I go into that, I'm, uh, Victor is going to have to help me with the microphone there later on. Um, I'm going to take uh, advantage of my privilege as chair to ask the first question. It's clear from your talk that Europe cannot continue the way it was. You, you had, there was a lot of words about reshoring, French shoring, uh, regionalization, deglobalization, um, that all driven by two fears. One is sudden shocks like the pandemic and the idea of trying to avoid the vulnerability that we had during the pandemic. And the second one was this whole idea of geopolitics, mm -hmm. making us, ourselves less vulnerable in the face of war, like the invasion of uh, Ukraine right mm -hmm. now. But this has happened, and you mentioned it also, this is happening in a period of four decades, at least, of globalization, in which in that period, Europe has remained highly dependent on foreign energy. You mentioned the question of rare earth uh, minerals and all other minerals. Uh, you mentioned semiconductors, which uh, Europe produces virtually none. So they're all in Taiwan, they're all in, in China, in, in Korea and Japan. And you also, uh, mentioned the whole idea that there has been, albeit in an indirect way, decentralization. What you're proposing is something which is, has been a dirty word for a long time, which is industrial policy. But we have deindustrialized, we probably haven't got the skills. So is Europe really ready for this deglobalization, this regionalization, this reshoring, this French shoring? in a world in which we have become so highly dependent from the rest? Well, uh, I mean, I don't know whether we are prepared, but uh, we have to prepare. We have to be, to be prepared. No, sorry. We are in a, in a completely different environment and we think uh, that um, this is a new trend, okay? And um, it seems to, to be that there are some signals uh, out there that um, might justify uh, this, um, this statement. Then of course uh, Europe will have to to react, and yes, true. Uh, one possibility is uh, moving in this direction no, that you were mentioning, industrial policies or whatever you want to to name them. I mean, some of the uh, all the, of the policies that I have already mentioned that uh, Europe is pursuing would be interpreted as as industrial uh, policy. Uh, here, my message would be: okay, yes, uh, this might be justified. Okay, the policies I were I was uh, I was mentioning, but we have to be careful. Okay, because of course, uh, governments are not always very good in trying to identify what is uh, the best sector industry that will be the lead in the future. That we know, and this is why we live uh, in a uh, 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 in a, a market economy, uh, and uh, on which uh, the, the government doesn't play a very significant role. Okay, there might be now a a justification to have a stronger role of the government on this, but we have to be careful that, of course, is the, should be the private sector leading okay, this, um, this, uh, this trend. And then, um, on which I'm completely sure, I was emphasizing this uh, very strongly in my, in my presentation, and I will do it again here, uh, Andres, uh, with this question, is that there is a, a also a second avenue that probably is complementary. Uh, and on this, I don't have any doubt that it is good by itself, even in a globalized world, uh, but that it can be particularly helpful in a deglobalized uh, world in order to compensate, uh, as I was saying, for uh, the cons negative consequences of, of this process, is that uh, Europe should integrate, uh, be integrated more. And, and, and that's clear. I'm, I'm, and, and we are not. I mean, in many domains, look at energy, energy markets. 
Um, well, the, the reality is that we don't have a single energy energy market. That even the the structure of our economies in terms of dependencies of uh, energy mix are very very and significantly uh, different uh, one from 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 the other, uh, which might be justified for natural resources or or even climate or, or whatever. This is this is okay, but. Uh, I'm not saying that we have to, to, to lead to an homogeneous no, a structure of energy mix, but that at least we, this uh, energy, the energy that any of us produces can fly to the rest of the, of the country. So that's one example. So in the end, depending on the, um, on, the, um, on the internal market, including, of course, there, the energy market, and all those elements that are what we call in Europe um, the governance uh, of the European Union that we know that are not complete. We know, I mean, not today. I mean, all the documents that have been written, the five uh, president report uh, um, and all, all the other documents that were produced in the last uh, four, six, uh, seven years are claiming for a banking union, a complete banking union, for a capital market union, for also a, a fiscal capacity uh, as uh, any other um, uh, federal state uh, has. So, I mean, the combination of these two things, I think, uh, with the, this combination and the proper combination of these two things, I think Europe should be should be prepared. Well, thank you very much, Pablo. So now, questions coming from the audience. Uh, Simona, if you can start, just state your name and who you are. Thank you. Uh, Simona Iammarino, University of Cagliari, Italy, and LSC. Uh, thank you. It was really great, inspiring. I... Uh, just three words of background. I've been studying, I mean, uh, conflict minerals, but also critical raw material more generally for five years now uh, here at the LSE. And uh, as we know and we see, cobalt, lithium, gallium, obnemium are key to AI and energy transition because the main technologies that uh, products are based on are actually intensive of this on these critical raw materials. So then what, what should Europe do? On the one hand, it seems to me a lot of research on alternatives and recycling, which however takes a long time and we know. On the other hand, don't you think that instead of putting the rhetoric on deglobalization, maybe it would be good to say, Europe as a champion of fair globalization, harvesting and harnessing, I mean, opportunities <laughs> for both the EU and the developing country. First of all, Africa, for example, where this material are mainly concentrated. What do you think about it? I would be- No, no, I, I, I would buy completely your, 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 your message, uh, Simona. In the end, I think it's even a, a very intelligent uh, way to, to, to go forward, no? because in the end, we know it's not only that we don't have these materials that you were mentioning, it's also that um, the, 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 there is a lot of concentration, a very high degree of concentration on the, on the countries on, um, that are uh, selling these products to, to Europe. So the idea of diversification, again, is important uh, here. And if you combine this with the idea of also uh, Europe trying to help other regions uh, of, uh, of the world, um, in this concept that you were using, uh, championship of uh, fair and globalization, I think it would be a, a very good uh, combination. And, and by the way, very much in the spirit of uh, what Europe has always pursued. So uh, I would uh, completely agree with what you were saying. There's a question over there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Suryansh from ESCP, and I had a quick question. Sorry, and the ESCB is? Uh, uh, pardon? You said you're Suryansh from ESCB, and yes. the ESCB is? Uh, Ecole Superior something. It's a French university. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it, I don't know its full name. <laughs> it's French. <laughs> uh, it, it, my question's on the lines of Miss Simona over there. Uh, how would EU as a whole be sure that the cobalt and uh, pal uh, palladium and other natural occ uh, occurring minerals in this world be a source through fair trade and not slavery and majorly looking at Africa. Because um, most of the gold which is mined in Congo, uh, has some sort of relation to slavery. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm on, I'm on the, the three type of policies that I was emphasizing that were behind the um, this strategy you know, uh, that uh, Europe is is following is, is following 
there was one that was precisely, I think it could be incorporated into this idea, okay, of uh, avoiding to, to buy products from uh, countries that uh, do not follow uh, certain, certain rules. Uh, to, to a certain extent, for me at least, it's not very different to this discussion that we are having. What happens if uh, Europe um, pursues, I mean, and I hope this is the case, uh, very strongly for uh, policies um, in order to, to meet our targets on climate change, but others are not doing the same. Okay? And, and we have already thinking about how not to put our companies our, uh, in a very uh, bad competitive uh, equilibrium because uh, they should compete or they might have to compete with uh, companies in other countries that are not following the same policies. Well, why not applying a similar uh, uh, concept, but this time not on, 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 uh, on, on climate issues, but on social issues, which is, a, the, I would say, the generic name that I would give to the concerns that, that you and, and Simona uh, had. Um, how to do this? I'm, I'm not an expert, but I can imagine that this could be this could be this could be done. By the way, this is this shouldn't be a very strange to us when when we are talking about um, uh, uh, all the policies that we want uh, to uh, to impose to private companies. We are referring yes to sustainability in terms of climate, but we are also uh, referring to to social. So the, the, there is an S also on on, on this SSD. Um, uh, claims that we are uh, trying to force to, to companies. No? Why not doing the same uh, for for governments? Um, I think this. Uh, I think I, I don't. I don't think that this should be incompatible with the policy that we are currently pursuing. And in fact, I think it's important that uh, this uh, should be taken in and uh, very seriously. Okay, if you go there to the back, there are quite a few hands now. So hopefully, we'll get to everyone. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'm Borja Ramirez from Citibank. Um, you mentioned um, the uh, the need to uh, 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 try to get uh, to close the, the Europe, European Banking Union. Um, what is your view on the on the next steps? Uh, and also, uh, if you could comment on the on the European banking uh, con con consolidation. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, uh, on, on, on the on the second part of the of the question, it's clear that the consolidation of the of the banking system, at least if you uh, look at the, the European dimension, is not happening. That's uh, that's obvious. No? And there are several reasons for them. One probably is because the the business case for this consolidation is much lower. So we know that one of the, of the elements that uh, incentivizes uh, consolidation is the cost reduction. And of course, cost reduction is much lower when the initial position uh, of, the, of the banks that might be merged or consolidated uh, do not uh, uh, have any market that is common, which is basically the case normally in, in Europe. So this is, uh, I, I think we should not forget this, no? because sometimes we focus on the second part, which is, of course, the relevant one from the policy perspective, which is, of course, that, I mean, probably we are not with the current um, uh, policy and regulatory rules, we are not incentivizing this to, to happen, at least not uh, sufficiently. Okay, And this is on, on which we should focus from the policy perspective. But don't forget that if there is no uh, an economic reasoning, a business case for this to happen, it, they, it won't happen. That uh, that we that we that we, that we know, and then on on on, on banking um, on banking union, well, I think we all know what is the missing part. The missing part is a, um, a deposit insurance scheme that is common, uh, and for me this is absolutely crucial for many many reasons. But even for the for the political governance of, of Europe, imagine the current situation that we are facing. So we are we have banks that are supervising Frankfurt, that if there is a problem. They are resolved in Brussels, but if there is public money that has to be put in order to facilitate the resolution, is the responsibility of national states. I mean, it doesn't make any, any any sense. And of course, we all know that the fact that we don't have this common uh, deposit insurance scheme is an origin in itself of fragmentation, of financial fragmentation. 
um, which of course for, for a policymaker that uh, uh, belongs to the central bank community, of course, that's um, a very, uh, a very uh, negative uh, factor, even for the transmission of monetary policy, by the way. There's a question there at the back. So if you go over there, so Devita. Thanks a lot for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Devita, and I'm doing my master's in local economic development. So, um, so cost of living crisis is a big uh, issue in the EU right now. And given that, uh, wouldn't looking for more secure options or like trying to uh, stop from being vulnerable to uh, outside factors, wouldn't that uh, deepen the cost of living crisis in the EU? Sorry, I, I don't think I have understood. Of course, the, the, the initial part of the question, sorry, and would you define the concept you want yeah. to? Yeah, so the cost of living crisis, cost of living crisis. Cost of living? Crisis. Cost of living crisis uh, has been a pressing issue in the EU. Given that, wouldn't looking for more secure options to not be vulnerable to the outside factors deepen the existing cost of living crisis, say energy, et cetera? Because currently prices are increasing majorly, so wouldn't that oh, just... Okay, but since this is a dialogue, let's, let's, let's um, um, transform it in a real dialogue. What do you mean by cost of living uh, crisis? Um, Increasing prices in general regarding energy, people have been protesting okay, across. Yeah. So the, the loss of, uh, of purchasing power. Okay. Yeah. And then the question is? The question is, uh, if you're saying EU shouldn't, uh, EU, uh, so you were mentioning how EU should be more secure and look for alternatives, say yes. um, energy, etc. Wouldn't that put more burden on the citizens as in increase the cost of living on the now whole? I, now, now I understand, sorry. Um, well, this is um, very much uh, related to, um, to another issue that um, uh, on which uh, we central bankers are also um, uh, very much focused, which is, I mean, what the potential consequences of, for example, climate change policies would mean for inflation, okay? Um, because, of, I mean, you can think of um, the energy shock, the negative energy shock that we have suffered during the last year, because this was for a bad reason. The, was the, the the invasion of um, of Ukraine uh, by by Russia, but you can imagine a situation on which we take very very seriously this uh, climate change action, and we and you know one of the instruments that would be more efficient for this is taxation, okay, and taxation would lead to higher prices, energy prices, and this is precisely what you want, so. Um, would you, 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 would you, you, would you think that there are uh, certain activities that are creating an external, uh, a negative externality? And precisely in order to internalize this externality, you, 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 you set a tax. Okay, that is the typical textbook uh, case for, uh, for, for taxation. Um, what the consequences uh, of this for citizens will be? Well, they will have to pay higher prices for certain products. That's obvious. Okay, in particular, energy products, at, the, at least energy products that are generated by non-renewable uh, energy, by uh, full, uh, fossil fuels, for example. That's clear in the short run. Oh, and this is why, precisely why, the political economy of uh, the fight against climate change is difficult. Okay, because, I mean, there is a price, at least in the short run. Um, um, but, and I think this is what I uh, would like to, to emphasize, which is, I think, also applicable to a situation on which you want to reduce the dependency on energy um, uh, uh, sources coming from abroad. Um, in the medium and long run, it's difficult to define what medium run uh, means, exactly means. Um, and for, uh, again, in the political domain, this is very important. Um, what we know is that renewable energy is cheaper. The, 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 the only issue, which of course is very relevant, is that um, renewable energy, we, we, we don't have still the technology to, to, to make it uh, disposable and available at any time because of storage, lack of capacity of storage, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think we have to play and, and to emphasize that yes, true, in principle, in the short run, these uh, tax increases would in the end uh, lead in the short run again to higher prices, there will be a change in, in, in relative prices. This is precisely what you want to, 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 to generate in the economy, 
precisely for for you and me to reduce the consumption uh, of, of certain of certain products and also for producers to to change completely or the production process or move to other to other businesses okay and there is always a transition cost but also with the mind uh, and with the idea that in the medium or the long run even at least in particular in the case of uh, of energy what we know today is that renewable energy is cheaper and if, if we put sufficient research uh, you were also mentioning simona before in your previous question well in the end uh, that's uh, that might be even more the case so that would be uh, my my answer but it's a very important question by the way there are questions over here so if you go over there get to Hi, I'm Meta, um, doing geography economics at DLSE. Um, so my question is like, given an increasing dependence on the global digital economy, um, do you see having a digital currency like what China is doing with the digital yuan or what Singapore is researching on and trying to codify um, money in a secure way as the way forward for central banks? Why or why not? Hmm. Well, um... The, the motivation for, uh, for central banks, including, of course, the, the European Central Bank, uh, to initiate a, a project on, on a potential um, digital euro, uh, I would say it is, is twofold. No? One is more, uh, more positive and the other is more defensive, no? if I can use the, this word. Well, the first one is, of course, that we, what we are observing in all domains of, uh, of our lives, but also uh, in, in the use of, uh, of money, is that uh, um, well, the use of banknotes in particular is declining in many, many countries. Okay? And we don't know really the, the discount in the end, uh, where it will end. Okay? So it makes a, a lot of sense for the central bank to uh, start studying whether they, there is, um, uh, we are in a position to offer an alternative that it is uh, in, digital, in digital format. Okay? And with the same, let's say, um, uh, security, privacy, etc elements than, uh, than the, the current uh, bank notes. And the second is, of course, that we are also observing um, that the, this crypto market, and in particular, these uh, stable coins um, that uh, have been developed um, by, by markets might, at some point, uh, also compete okay, with, um, with, public, uh, with public money. Maybe not so much. This is not so, so relevant, this more defensive uh, attitude for, for developed countries. Okay? But I can imagine that, in particular, for developing countries or in stable uh, countries, uh, political uh, instability, this could be uh, dangerous. Okay, um, so it makes again a lot of sense to try to uh, study, uh, in principle, uh, this um, this um, the possibility you know, of issuing a digital uh, currency. Um, we at the Aerosystem we have initiated the project um, because what we want is basically to be in a position if there is a need. We think, uh, or the citizens think that there is a need for issuing a, a digital currency to be technically in a position to offer. Okay, and this is why we have uh, uh, started the project. It will take a few uh, a few more years. We are also observing and um, um, discussing with other central banks in, uh, that uh, are doing the, the the same. But it's important to to emphasize that we haven't decided yet to issue a, a digital uh, currency. We will have to. To look at all these technical elements that are very complex, uh, by 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 the way, and we'll have also to have a business case to do so. And in parallel, we will have to be very sure, uh, completely sure that issuing a digital currency is compatible with uh, financial stability. So there are many elements there that we have to be considered before uh, taking this uh, this decision. Yeah, I'm conscious that there are quite a few questions also coming from the center, but uh, we will get there for logistical reasons. Uh, your question now. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Um, my name's Mithali. Can you get the microphone closer and... Uh... Sorry. Sorry, is this better? Yes. Yes. Uh, be like, a, I don't know, a singer. Just put it right next to your mouth and it will <laughs> hear you strongly. Okay, I will do. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Governor. My name's Mithali Thapa. I'm a senior risk analyst at the Bank of England um, and an alumina of LSE. Um, you mentioned three key themes in terms of shifts towards diversification security and regionalism, and then further spoke about policy uncertainty. My question uh, is, how do we ensure central banking regulation and supervisory policy 
is strengthened enough to navigate increasingly complicated cross-border jurisdiction of major financial players, yet flexible enough to encourage growth and innovation? That's a simple question. So, <laughs> Well, I guess there were like two elements in the, in the question, if I've interpreted you well. The first one is to how to guarantee that we we keep uh, with uh, financial regulation that uh, sufficiently strong in all jurisdictions in order to guarantee financial stability. Um, well, I mean, in the end, um, well, you know that I'm I'm chairing now the Basel Committee on, on Banking Supervision, and my experience uh, chairing uh, this uh, committee uh, has been very very uh, positive in the sense that, of course, I mean, in the end. Is, it is the, the willingness no, of, of, of jurisdictions to agree and then to apply and to implement in full what we agree in the Basel, uh, in the, at the Basel Committee, um, what it is behind um, the, 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 the fact that currently we have, well, uh, very good, for example, banking regulation that has served us very, very well, for example, during the pandemic and also during the energy crisis. And probably the best way to guarantee this is to, to keep no, this, um, this uh, international uh, committees in this international ad agenda on which we are able to, to agree and then later to convince uh, citizens that uh, what we have ag agreed in um, these uh, international committees is good, not only for uh, domestic citizens, but also for the, for the international community. And then the second part, uh, uh, my interpretation was that you were trying to, 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 to try to make a trade-off between financial regulation and growth. And growth. No, and uh, I don't know whether that was your intention, but if let me in, in any case try to, I don't think there is such a trade-off, in the sense that I mean uh, to have a, a tough regulation uh, or let's not put adjective to it. So a regulation that is able to guarantee financial stability um, in general across the globe is very positive for growth. We have already seen and we have many good examples and in particular the the last global financial crisis of the consequences of having um, a banking sector or a financial sector in general that doesn't guarantee financial stability and the consequences of this financial instability uh, are particularly important for citizens are, are citizens in the end uh, those who lose their jobs in those uh, extreme uh, and dramatic circumstances of course again the global financial crisis is the the last uh, example of uh, what I'm saying. So the, I do. I, I never. I, probably not, it was not your intention, no? but uh, so probably I, I misunderstood it. But uh, in, uh, for me, there is no 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 trade off. Yeah. Interval with the jumper here. So. Hello, I am I'm Daniel. I'm a master's student in local economic development, and I want to ask a question regarding interest rates. If you think that this historic rise of uh, interest rate by the European Central Bank is here to stay, or is rather a temporary solution that these policy shifts will end up alleviating the weight on, on central bankers to use interest rates to keep inflation at 2%? Ooh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> no, uh, uh, of course, because in the end, um, it's, 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 it's also related to, to this discussion I was uh, introducing in, in the last part of my talk the third part of my talk on to what extent globalization, but there are many other phenomena, no? um, climate change, uh, any other uh, demographics, etc. cetera, uh, in the end, whether they would lead to a higher uh, natural interest rate. And uh, it is true, I mean, before the pandemic, there was a, a, a clear consensus among economists that natural uh, interest rates in all developed world was very, very low. Okay, and this was the justification for how for having very low interest rates in, in, in most uh, uh, developed countries. Whether the pandemic or the consequences of these geopolitical discussions that we are having in the end would lead to a dramatic change in, in natural interest rates, I think it's too early to say. So now we are focused uh, on, um, on fighting against the inflation spike. And this is already, I, I would say, the very, uh, a, very, a very difficult uh, job. Uh, at some point, uh, of course, we will have to uh, to take a stop of to what extent um, all these developments uh, uh, are leading or not to an increase in, in natural interest rates. Or not. But I, now, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't try to, um, to give you a, an answer because I, I really don't know. Uh, it's um, exactly the same or similar question to 
to what extent the, the inflation dynamics and the inflation and very high inflation environment that we are still observing, whether in the end this will lead to, um, to a move uh, and, and to an exit from the very low inflation environment that we have lived before the pandemic. It's not obvious. It's, it's not obvious uh, uh, at all. Um, because, well, it's true. I mean, if we enter into a deglobalization process, this might lead, I was, uh, I was mentioning, uh, to a potential um, high, uh, more high inflation environment. Uh, you might also think that the climate change might lead also to high inflation, at least in the, in the short or medium run. But in the in the long run, that's not so obvious, as I was trying to answer before. Demographics um, uh, will also play a role. I don't see there uh, anything different to what I was observing before the, 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 the pandemic, apart, of course, for the very dramatic consequences of the pandemic itself. Um, so I, th I don't know, at some point in time, uh, after we uh, control uh, inflation, we will have to come back to these issues and uh, to really uh, assess and analyze to what extent uh, this, uh, what it is happening um, in our economies in the last three years uh, have uh, really changed uh, those uh, patterns of uh, natural uh, interest rates or, or inflation. Now, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be in a position to give a, a, very, a very clear answer to those, uh, to those questions. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. There are a lot of hands. I'm going to already apologize to everyone that is not going to be able to ask a question, but uh, despite the energy that you're demonstrating, Pablo has had a very, very difficult day and we will all want to uh, end up by 7.30 or thereabouts. So there are going to be four more questions and I'm going to ask them, they're going to come in pairs. This gentleman over here, this man over here, this gentleman over there, and the woman at the back, and apologies to everyone else. So now two questions in a row that Pablo can ask. So if you can be brief, that'll be excellent. We'll do more words. My name from MSC Finance and Economics. Uh, in one of your answers to the earlier questions, um, you mentioned that the uh, digital currency would have to have the same standards of um, privacy as, as banknotes do. Um, I imagine this being tough to implement. Um, how do, or do, do you think this this is um, feasible? And um, if not, do you think this could pose an issue or 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 rather not? Yeah, before Thank you, you answer, if you can pass the microphone all the way to that man over there. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Neighbor Yu from I'm doing the local economic development at LSE. And recently, the Financial Times point, uh, report that the <clears throat> Argentina and Brazil are preparing for the common currency recently. So I was wondering how do you, what's your view of the future of this common currency? And how, what do you think the opportunities and the risks for the Euro, European, European Union and the globalization process? All right, Pablo. Uh, cryptocurrencies or uh, yeah. digital currencies. I will, I will also try to, to be brief uh, so that um, the others uh, also are able to, to make their questions. No, uh, maybe I was misunderstood. We, I mean, we are, this is very, very important. The privacy issue is very, very important. But it's, this is some, one element that we have to analyze. So I don't have a final uh, answer to, to, to this. Um, of course, we have to ask also to citizens what the requirements that they will have for... for um, for, for a potential digital currency. And also we have also to take into account technology. To what extent this is feasible, exactly what you were saying. So this is a, a very important question that we will have to answer precisely through, uh, through the project, okay? And then uh, on the Brazil, Argentina, um, I mean, uh, my, I don't know, I, I don't have the details. Uh, I, the only thing I know is uh, what I've read in, 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 in the news. Um, of course, uh, for me, uh, the European experience uh, has been very, very good. But it is also true that the European experience was um, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a single uh, currency, was almost the last step of a process of integration that took many, many years. And that allowed, to, to a great extent, to, to have um, a, a common currency without, let's say, uh, or eliminating or minimize, minimizing some uh, potential uh, negative uh, consequences of this project. So uh, what I would uh, say that uh, I think in the case of Argentina and, uh, and Brazil of any other alternative that might uh, emerge, I think it's important to guarantee that the integration process is um, uh, behind 
the, the potential introduction, uh, introduction of, uh, of the common currency uh, has, is, being, is well developed. So that the, the economic uh, fundamentals for, uh, behind the, the single currency are, are strong. Okay. Please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Victor Arte. Uh, I'm studying here at LSC, uh, the Master of Public Policy. And thank you for your, your presentation. It was very, very insightful. I wanted to ask you on industrial policy. Um, you mentioned that the answer to, to, to this kind of deglobalization is more integration, capital, uh, capital markets, union, banking union, fiscal capacity. Um, but it seems that the Commission is, is moving the way around. It's flexible, flexibilizing uh, state aid rules and so on. So what do you think is that uh, maybe an intermediate step that, that because it does, all the capital markets and so on doesn't seem to be politically feasible in the short term, at least my, my perception, is there any intermediate step that we can do that, that might help us um, sort of get, uh, get to it? Thank you. And if you can pass the microphone to the back. Yeah, you. Um, hello, hi. I hope you're all doing well. Can you get your microphone closer? To you? Hello, hi. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Adriana Mguni, and I'm here uh, with Virtuous Grace and Lord Emmanuel. I wanted to ask um, concerning immigrants that are not permitted to work and the impact that it has on the economy, and what is the... Um, what, uh, what suggestions do you have concerning uh, immigration? Uh, people are not permitted to work, but desire to work instead of them relying on the on the state. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, uh, it's a, a difficult question. I'm not an expert on, on, on immigration, but let me put it in, in economic terms. No? Um, what it is obvious um, is um, that uh, Europe is aging. Um, that, um, I mean, population growth is, uh, I mean, the trend is uh, clearly on, on, on a downward uh, path. And that this is one of the reasons why, um, when we uh, estimate the potential output growth of the European economy going forward, we get uh, lower numbers. Okay, this is affecting the, the uh, economic growth and will affect the economic growth in the future. And of course, one uh, possibility in order to compensate for the for the domestic and national dynamics of, uh, of demographics is by increasing migration okay and i think the experience uh, of europe uh, uh, over the last uh, decades has been very uh, very positive in this in this regard of course um, there are uh, always issues of integration in particular uh, labor market integration of immigrants that are crucial in order precisely not only uh, for uh, for this uh, positive effects on in terms of, of growth but also for for social cohesion that are absolutely uh, relevant but I, I think that europe uh, should be uh, um, in a position to manage those uh, those uh, those challenges okay so um uh, migration will remain a very important topic uh, i'm pretty sure in the next uh, decades uh, for, for, for for you uh, and then on the on the on the first uh, question I don't know, I, I'm not sure that I have a quick win, okay? Um, my point was, okay, we are entering into um, this new world, okay, of um, trying to, to, to gain more autonomy, less dependency, more diversification. This is completely new for us, okay? We, I mean, three years ago, we were not discussing this, uh, on this topic, or at least um, the, 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 the the strength of the discussion now has, has is, 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 very, is very high. But let's not forget that, that there might be cost, efficiency cost uh, of, uh, of this deglobalization uh, process. And I'm not saying this is not completely justified what the European Commission, the European Council uh, is, is putting on the, on the table, but in precisely in order to compensate for some of these potential um, consequences, don't forget that we have a still uh, some steps uh, to, to go in terms of uh, integrating our economies. And this can be seen or should be seen, in my view, precisely as an element to compensate for the potential cost. Um, and if you want a rank of the three elements I was mentioning, the three of them are very relevant. The three of them, capital market unions, absolutely crucial. So uh, Europe is, is an economy on, uh, that if you compare it with the US, for example, there are two main differences that are very negative for the European economy. The first one is that 
capital uh, market based financing is very low. And the second is that we don't have a unique and a single capital market. There is fragmentation. In the end, these two factors are affecting negatively the capacity uh, of uh, the investment capacity of, uh, of, the, of the European of the European Union. Uh, and with banking union, I was referring to it uh, previously exactly the same, or, or with a fiscal capacity. I mean, of course, during the pandemic, European governments were able, in a very dramatic situation, to agree in a few weeks um, to a, an instrument with NGU funds that was able to compensate for the fact that we don't have this fiscal capacity. But I think it will uh, make a, a lot of sense to have already a design that it's stable and that, I mean, there is not a need to, to for an agreement in the middle of a crisis, which is always very difficult. Um, and again, all federal states uh, have uh, similar uh, instruments and similar mechanisms. Why Europe uh, uh, is not having uh, one? Um, the three of, of these pieces are, are, are relevant. Um, of course, I'm conscious that in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, it's not easy uh, politically. Uh, we know we know that, but uh, I mean, uh, I don't think there is a, on the contrary, I think there is now a new reason to uh, not only to start uh, this debate because the debate started many years ago, but to be concrete in terms of the of the policy outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to take my prerogative as uh, chair to go back to something you said and ask you if you allow me a slightly more political question as a final question. Um, you emphasize very much in your presentation and then in my the answer to my first question, the need for greater European integration. But let me just be a devil's advocate. And uh, how feasible is that in a Europe where Eurosceptic vote has gone from 6% in 2004 to 26% last year, where we have three countries, Italy, Poland, and Hungary, governed by clear Eurosceptic parties, and where we have lost one country to Brexit and their threats or potential threats that this might happen in other parts of Europe? I think it's feasible. I think it's feasible. I think the, the um, I, I don't think we have to be pessimistic on this. Um, referring to also to, to, the, to the question, to the last, uh, to my answer to the last question, um, we, we already, this, the, the, the European governments gave a unique and extraordinary response to the pandemic. And it was a common, it was a unique uh, response. Uh, why in a also very complex uh, country, uh, context, all of extraordinary uh, context, on which we all know the, the solution, uh, the optimal solution uh, for Europe to give is more euro. I mean, I, there is none of the challenges I was mentioning in my, in my, in my talk at the beginning that is, could be optimally answered individually by European. No, give me one no. So in the end, if this is uh, so obvious uh, for all of, us, uh, all of us, then press our governments to do what we want to do, which is uh, to have a, a deeper integration in, in, in Europe. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'd like to end up on a positive note. Pablo, it's been a real privilege to have you here and to have you in an open, frank conversation. I told you, some of you at least, that uh, uh, central bank governors have to measure their words because whenever they say something, a lot of economic things might happen and a lot of the cost of living may rise or may go down. Having someone like Pablo Hernando de Cos come in here and having unfiltered completely unfiltered questions is very rare. And I think we are very lucky to have him here. You're welcome anytime you want to come here. And remember, first, I think we should uh, then again, thank him in the usual way, because I think it has been absolutely amazing. So many thanks, Pablo. And thank you. for all of you here, remember that the Cañada Blanche uh, Center at the LSE is not finished. This is the second event we have had this week, the fourth this term. There'll be two more events uh, coming before the end of the term. 
we'll have the fellows presentation that will take place at the beginning of the month of uh, March. Then we have the first vice president of the Spanish government, Nadia Calvino, coming on the 31st of March at three o'clock. And that will be followed in the spring by the uh, Cañada Blanche Forum in lovely Valencia, which is going to be very much related to what you're saying, which is mainly about investment and also about global value change and, and the, sorry, global value chains and the change in global value chains. And we're going to have a virtual event in early May, I think is the 10th of May, 11th of May, uh, dealing with uh, the development and the regional development trap in Europe and across the world. So please follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube channel. And to those of you here and to those of you following us live, many thanks and see you at the next event. Thank you very much and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.